universities and our nursing colleges is on the decline and at an increasing rate as depicted in the previous slide. So consequently, the, consequently, the occupational shortages of nurses expressed as hearty for vacancies remains persistent and entrenched. The HWCTA support to the nursing sector um, is actually over a number of areas. We support our nursing colleges through bursaries, um, including bursaries for the highest certificate of nursing, the diploma and the bachelor of nursing. Um, so you can see over the number of years uh, leading up to 21-22, a thousand and eight learners were supported to the value of 77 million rand. Then our support to nursing colleges in terms of learnerships includes programs in higher certificate for nursing diplomas in nursing, advanced diplomas in medical and surgical nursing, diploma in nursing on midwifery. So for the last um, two financial years, we have supported 430 learners to the value of 22 million rand. We have also supported nursing colleges through teaching aids. Our HWC to board approved funding at improving the teaching and learning platform for public nursing colleges. This enabled the nursing colleges to produce, procure items such as modern mannequins and simulators, modern birthing fetus mannequins, stethoscopes and suction units and journals. And these items are absolutely critical to ensure quality learning in our colleges. So for the year 19, uh, 19 uh, in, in the year 2019 to 2021 of the last two financial years, 31 million was spent on the supply of these teaching aids. And these are the colleges that have benefited from the funding of 31 million rand. So it is over most of the provinces, Chair. Uh, during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there was a necessity to urgently upskill our healthcare professionals in the screening, diagnosing, testing, treatment, and overall management of patients infected with the virus, uh, simultaneously protecting and maintaining their own well-being as colleagues and family contacts uh, to ensure that they are safe against the infection. So in terms of this chair, uh, we wanted to in particular highlight two of our interventions that we are very proud of. The HWC to facilitated the training of 2,302 healthcare professionals at a cost of two and a half million rand. A further 25,000 frontline workers were trained on COVID-19 at a cost of 15 million rand. And this initiative was a multi-partnership between the HWCTA, ETDPCTA, and BITS Health Consortium. In addition, Chair, our, our second project that we are quite proud of is the Health and Welfare CETA assisted the Chief Nursing Officer in the National Department of Health with the training of 420 intensive care unit nurses in handling critical cases of COVID-19 patients. This collaboration was done through the Forum of the University Nursing Deans of South Africa, and the total cost of this project was 1.2 million rand. Chair, we also support the agricultural sector. Through work integrated learning, we supported 97 learners at Solo Agricultural and Rural Development Institute, which is called TARDI, for work integrated learning in the last financial year at a cost of 2.1 million rand. Furthermore, we supported internships for the year 2020, 10 internships on supporting animal health technicians at TARDI to the amount of 677,000 Rand. We also supported le lecturer development programs in the last financial year, 
33 lecturers of TARDI were enrolled on the lecturer development program at 250,000 Rand. And bursaries chair in the last two financial years, 300 learners were supported through bursaries towards the diploma in animal health at TARDI. And that came to a cost of 20 million Rand. Uh, so there it is, and um, the support for nursing over the period and also support for the agricultural sector. In total, um, over the last two financial years, we have supported these two particular sectors to the amount of 173 million rand. A chair also working with the Office of Health Standards Compliance within the National Department of Health, the CETA is funding 500 healthcare managers on healthcare quality and a patient safety program. This program has also yielded much impact and success in the sector. The project started in the year 2021 and costed 7 million rand. The program is spearheaded by Safaku Mahatu Health Sciences University and is aimed at supporting the healthcare quality improvement plan in the public sector. This investment will be extended in the next year and a further 200 mid-level managers will be trained culminating in the establishment of quality learning centers in each province in our country. A further 200 social workers working in health facilities will also benefit from this training. This program chair builds capacity on the ground for implementation of the national health insurance. Our chair, what we also want to in particular highlight is a new initiative that has happened um, in the sector. It's called the Future Nursing Forum. It is mobilizing the future nursing workforce for South Africa, and it's to develop an implementation plan or a roadmap to address the shortages or the capacity needs of nursing in our country. So it is bringing together both the public and the private healthcare providers to broadly identify the areas of need and demand and the supply of nurses across the sector and of course validate this information. The focus is primarily on the need for nurses, basic nurses and speciality nurses as being core of the healthcare system. We have representatives of business, labor, the Department of Health, the South African Nursing Council, the HWC and HASA. So it is truly a public private partnership initiative to actually address this need in our country. Of course, it is influenced um, by various strategies and uh, also to determine the key challenges to addressing the gap and how can we quickest uh, be able to address that gap uh, to identify key uh, levers and opportunities to address the gap, to identify next steps to implement interventions with clear timelines, and to confirm commitment of key stakeholders to work together, Chair, to ensure that we can address any implementation plans and the gap in this particular sector. Uh, Chair, with that, I'd like to thank the, the committee and um, I would hand it over to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, CEO um, and the Chair of uh, Asian W. Thank you very much also to the colleagues at Agricita and the department um, uh, for your presentations. Uh, members, as you know, uh, this is your time now. I'm trying to check on my screen. There's no one for now. Um, oh, uh, yeah, very good, very good. 
Yeah, I think I will bring, I will, I will, I will come at a later stage with mine. So I'll start with Mams Bia, followed by Honorable Boshoff and um, uh, Honorable Mananiso. Uh, Honorable Sibia, uh, uh, Ngenama. Thanks, Chaperson. Allow me to switch off my video due to my connectivity. Um, morning to everyone. Thanks for all presentations. Um, uh, regarding the um, career guidance, how often do the CITAS convene career guidance campaigns on bursaries? How much uh, um, the CITAS spending annually in the administration of their in-house bursaries? The other one on the bursaries is how many people are employed within the CITAS to perform this function? And the last one under bursary is how to CETA advertise its bursary opportunities. And having said that, yeah, the CETA plays social workers and social auxiliary workers in schools. Um, what, uh, what is the criteria used by the CETA to place social workers and the social auxiliary workers at schools? The other one is how is the provincial distribution of placement social workers and social auxiliary school the workers. Um, at this moment, is is all this question. Thanks, you, Chairperson. Thanks, my honourable uh, Bosho. Thank you, honourable uh, chair, and it's nice to call you so uh, today. I uh, yeah, I want to uh, express my appreciation for all the. Um, presentations that we received uh, and I was especially impressed with uh, this one from the health CETA uh, because I uh, I think the the success in in training under difficult uh, circumstances uh, is very important but I actually want to focus on the agricultural colleges and I want to know uh, what the department's thinking of it is in terms of autonomy I think if we look at the, the um, Department of Higher Education, then universities are very autonomous, although funded by the department for a great part. And TVET colleges function somewhat like a department, a little bit like a school under the Department of Basic Education or under the provincial departments, with not too much autonomy. Uh, where uh, I know that the um, department referred to the autonomy, but I just would like to have some more information on that and whether it will be institutionalized that um, organize the boards. And I want to refer to this last presentation from the health and uh, what the W stands for, welfare uh, CETA, where it referred to the fact that uh, uh, nursing training, uh, training was disrupted um, when it had to be done according to the, um, let's say, the prescripts of higher education. And I think it's something that we often see that a certain change makes a lot of sense on paper, but the system is working. And then one changes a working system. Uh, in a way which uh, seems quite uh, profoundly good, but the system is disrupted and then you lose a few years in good training, which has to be, or which have to be uh, um, uh, make it up after a few years. Now, at the moment, I don't think that I'm at risk of, of lying if I say that the um, old agricultural colleges from changes uh, during the past few years and it, it may just well be a, a, an improvement to go over to the department of higher education but if the system is uh, very responsive and i know that uh, the agricultural sector uh, is um, um, uh, constituted in such a way that they they can respond very quickly if they see something is not working but then the institutional pathway 
of responding to, let's say, suboptimal functioning of the colleges uh, must be open. And that, uh, that would dictate, I would say, or that would at least suggest that it would be very good to have uh, organized agriculture. And with that, I don't only mean the farming unions or uh, Agri-SA and its subsidiaries and uh, TLU-SA, but also AGBIS, the old cooperatives, which are now called agribusinesses, um, uh, that they should all be um, institutionally very closely involved to make sure that we have a, a real improvement in um, training in the agricultural sector when it goes over to this department. Uh, if I may just close with that, I think that within the Department of Agriculture, in which ever, ever guys, uh, DEF or DAELRD or whatever, I don't think that uh, agriculture as a sector uh, really felt that it had uh, input into the whole system. Otherwise, the decay in um, the old Pampun Bure at Bochovstrom um, and some of the other institutions wouldn't have happened. On the other hand, of course, there are some institutions. My best knowledge is that Grootfontein at Middelburg, for example, is still an excellent uh, institution, but it's not across the board. Uh, so with that question and those commentaries, uh, I thank you for the opportunity, uh, Chairperson. Chairman, now I can at least say uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Honorable Bosov. Uh, Honorable Mananiso. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, let me start by welcoming all the presentations. And one must say that I'm very pleased by Agricita in terms of how they have actually presented uh, their beneficiary data in terms of demographics and as well areas where they are located. So I hope many of those who are here in this platform today, they would learn from them so that they understand that uh, issues of transformation is of paramount to us as the portfolio committee. So uh, well done to Agrisita. And uh, Chair, let me start with my questions from the presentation of DHET on slide uh, 12 on their organizational output will program, they have indicated uh, in terms of their demographics breakdown for youth and so on. So I want to check if possible, they can actually give us per province in terms of their slide uh, presentation. And as well, I need clarity if this slide 12 and slide 14 is continuation of slide 12 or it's just a standalone presentation because if you can check on slide 14 uh, they have given us a detailed report with regards to provinces of their beneficiaries however they didn't give us demographics in terms of people with disability and so on so i just want to get clarity with regards to that and indicate to them that in future uh, they should be consistency on how they actually give the report with the gastri beneficiary data. Um, Chair, the other issue as well is on the phase approach. I'm, I'm happy about how they actually gave us the presentation. However, one would want to suggest that they must write to us uh, in detail the program of action with regards to those particular phases. Because our uh, interest is to actually track if they've been moving as per their plan uh, as the department. So uh, can they just submit to us uh, with regards to that uh, report of their faces and indicate actually where they could have actually um, achieved what they could have planned and what are the issues with regards to things that they plan to do and they didn't do. Uh, it's with regards to issues of the face approach. And uh, Chair, let me start as well on, I've got, you know, many notes that I've I've done. I would just pick and choose there. Uh, uh, to DHEAD, my question as well is, is the migration process concluded? And if not, what is the status of the function shift of both agriculture and nursing colleges? What was the deadline for the migration process? What was the outcome of the feasibility study? 
What were the budgetary implications for the migration? Was there a funding strategy? Were there infrastructure development needs? To what extent, if any, did the DHEAD budget increase as a result of the migration? In terms of legislation uh, and amendments, I want to check how, how is the migration process impacted? Uh, what lessons could have the department learned with regards to the process itself? And uh, I want to check as well, because uh, last time when we met with other sitters, I've indicated that at times when I'm uh, watching Moja Lab, I would see agriculture and nursing colleges being one of those uh, colleges that people would speak about Buga's um, institution and so on. So I want to check if this particular courses that these uh, institutions are offering are they accredited and to date do they have cases uh, with in relation to corruption and if if if, if not what is the status quo do they have uh, as well, any process of consequence management with regards to those who could have you know defaulted in terms of the credibility of uh, these particular institutions uh, the other issue as well, I want to check uh, how is the relationship uh, with uh, NESFAS as an institution for funding? Uh, if Is there any other working relations? I want to check as well the working relations with other departments that relates to issues of agriculture, if, if there's any from the Ed. Uh, the other question is with regards to the function shift of agriculture colleges from provincial competency to to, to DHEAD. Also consider the student uh, funding of NESFAS. Uh, I want to check the uh, engagement with the National Treasury to secure additional funding for students in agricultural colleges. Uh, the other issue, Chairperson, is with relation to Tibet colleges. Uh, is there any impact with regards to the shift of other responsibilities? Whether the DHEAD has conducted asset verification at all these colleges that would be you know, uh, affected by this particular migration? Are there signed protocols in place to guide the function shift? If so, can they share that with the committee? And uh, Chairperson, uh, with regards to Agricita, um, my question with Agricita, it's, um, I think Masbia asked it with, uh, on the issue of the uh, uh, outreach program. I'm, I'm glad that I'm one of those who, who her constituencies actually benefiting from the uh, 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 outreach program. So on that one, I'm partly covered. However, one would want to, to emphasize that this particular uh, services of outreach programs, they must actually go to schools because uh, at times they are being conducted by us or other institutions out of school. So they need to make sure that they take this uh, uh, outreach program within uh, the schools. Uh, issues of uh, non-compliance uh, for training that requires standards by the training providers Post accreditation has been identified as a risk. What is the mitigation plan uh, by 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 the by Acrisita? I want to check as well the issue of um, the four IR policy because in one of the uh, slides they have indicated that now they can actually connect a beneficiary to a workplace and so on. And so I want to check I, is. Are they doing this within their policy? Uh, what has been done so far to address the e-learning challenges? Uh, I want to check as well the impact of uh, COVID-19 from all the entities that have presented today, because you would know these two uh, sectors that we are speaking about today, they, are, they, were, they never had actually the hard lockdown like others. So, what, but what are the impact with regards to COVID-19? Uh, Agricita, again, has been done to ensure that planned performance outcomes are achieved because in, in some areas we can see that there are challenges. And I just want to check with them uh, with regards to the challenges. Are these challenges based on the issue of 
human capital uh, or the systems uh, they can just uh, give us sense in terms of what is happening because you you know honorable Lydia, there are many things that are happening in these cities that most of us we even hear them on on the ground uh, chairperson i want to ask the CETA as well to vanish the committee with qualifications of the senior management including the board so that perhaps we can check uh, if they have right people in right places, because now we no longer say what needs to be done. We are saying we are doing one, two, three, and we are we must rectify one, two, three. Uh, Chair, without uh, wasting time, let me uh, go to HW CETA with them as well. I I, I have I, I have programs that one could have conducted uh, so the parliamentary constituency office. However, they need to as well make sure that they strengthen their outreach programs. According to HW CETA uh, annual performance plan, the, the sector has four programs with a budget of 530 million for 2022-23. Is the budget adequate for the CETA to achieve its mandate? How does the limited budget impact the performance of the entity? On page 49 of the APP, the CETA identifies the following risk. Lack of timeless compliance with the criteria of discretionary grant, funding by employers resulting in material decommitments each year. Are there consequence management to them as well? I, we, I just want to check. And uh, the other issue is with regards to the slow rate of prosecution of skills development providers who defrauded learners due to lack of legislative tool for this purpose. So uh, on this one, Chair, I would want to ask uh, HW CETA to actually forward to us the report with regards to anything that has to do with fraud within the institution and what is it that they are doing and the status quo thereof. And just to check as well, if we do have these people within our system, uh, the other issue is uh, how many SDPs have been prosecuted to date? Yeah, that report must just uh, include everything there. And uh, Chair, the other thing that I just want to check, I think it's with regards to HWC, because of uh, they indicated on the issue of, uh, you know, limited enrollment or of, 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 of student nurses. So I, I, I want to check if they have a plan with regards to bazaaris like your Funza Lushaga that can accommodate those who would want to go through nursing so that they are able to get the, uh, those uh, uh, beneficiaries as immediate uh, employees for public institutions. So I, I want to check is there any plans and issues of how low numbers of students who pass with maths and science impact their enrollment in health-related programs. Uh, I want to check if there's any study that they could have done with relating to that. And uh, one wants to say to them, they need to uh, make sure that they intensify their learner programs. Uh, last time when we met with CITAS, I think earlier last year, we have requested uh, the skills development uh, unit to actually have one career guidance uh, document that would have all these opportunities for all the sitters. But today I haven't seen such, I, I, I would only pick, uh, you know, single documents from all these particular sitters. So if that uh, the is on the platform, can they just uh, make sure that they fast track this issue of ensuring that we have one career guidance that has all this particular information so that at least our people would have, you know, all these services uh, in, in, in one document and uh, they must use them friendly. Lastly, on issue of the CETA as well, HW CETA, I want to check if they do have the policy as well like uh, others. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Yeah, no, you are fighting. Honorable uh, Mashatsi. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. I hope I'm audible. And uh, Slalom. 
in relation to, first and foremost, let me also welcome all the presentation made by both cities as well as the department. They are quite refreshing in terms of progress. However, I just want to emphasize on what Honorable Mananiso has indicated in relation to the department. Um, can we at least have a roadmap of the migration um, in being inclusive to all the issues that he has spoken to, legislation, financial capacity, and human capacity for process of migration, and also give you know an, a, a progress in as far as the roadmap is concerned. Secondly, Chair, on the agri CETA, I just want to, you know, CETAs are quite important in relation to a creation of employment for young people who are unemployed, those who are leaving schools, and those who would need placement after qualific uh, um, getting qualifi uh, qualifications. I just want to find out from them what will it take to increase the number of learners in terms of intake? because um, much as they are doing what they can with in relation to their own financial capacity, but beyond financial capacity, do they've got capacity to have more intake so that we deal with youth unemployment in the country? Secondly, Chair, is the outcomes of placement of students um, in this particular, uh, by the CETA, do they monitor uh, after a period in terms of contractual um, periodic placement, do they monitor uh, progress made by those students in those um, as per the placement? And what is the outcome? Where are they? Can we locate the students who are, have been placed? What is the monitoring system uh, that they use to make sure that uh, we do not find scams in as far as placements of students? Two, on the audit outcome, they are saying they have been having an unqualified audit uh, report for the past 10 years. When are we getting a proper clean audit? Is the intention because 10 unqualified does not necessarily mean it's a clean audit? Can they get it? We get an indication in terms of uh, financial management and so forth and so on. Are they intending to or do they want to stick to unqualified for the next 10 years? Um, on issues of the intake, I just want to find out from them, uh, how do they determine the numbers of intake? Uh, when you look different provinces, it's different numbers. So how, what, how do they make that determination to say, KZN must get this much, this one must get this much? Because when you look at slide 44 to 45, um, Northern Cape and Free State, their numbers are quite low. And, in actual fact, all inland provinces, besides Limpopo, their numbers are quite low. And when you look at the agricultural sector itself, Free State, Northern Cape, are uh, agricultural provinces, including Northwest. Why are, is Agricita taking such low numbers in these specific provinces? I'm not... Um, uh, uh, advocating for Free State because I'm from the Free State, but Free State is an agricultural province. So why are the numbers this slow? When we move to um, and HWS CETA, Chair, in their presentation, they make reference to um, support, um, supporting government departments with a social workers and and um, auxiliary uh, social auxiliary workers in schools. I just want to find out how many have been placed in as far as this project is concerned. What is the duration of the placement and the cost of placement? And also, um, are they able? Do they have a monitoring system to make sure that uh, this placement is, is is done promptly and so forth and so on? Because when you look at social economic challenges, especially as um, social ills, we would need this program to be enhanced to deal with the issues of bullying, to deal with issues of gender-based violence. So I just want to find out from them what their numbers and uh, placement and the duration of the placement. 
Um, the other issue on 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 HWU theta is the skills development intervention. What is the provincial contribution to 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 their skills development um, intervention? And also emphasizing on the gender transformation issue that Honorable Mananiso has spoken to. Just to check, Kuti, are they do they have a deliberate and intentional program that focuses on that specific, specific issue? Lastly, Chair, when you look at the bursaries, we must indicate that both Agricita as well as 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 uh, HWCTA uh, are doing quite well, and we are happy that. They are also focusing on the postgrads because this is where we are seated with challenges in terms of finances. I think um, the department is doing its part, but if we could actually enhance in terms of numbers, because most students, they finish with NSFAS, they get their undergrad, but when you have to move to postgrad, we have got challenges because NRF does not have much more and uh, many resources. So. If they could actually expand on that space as well, we would be very happy. Thank you very much, Slam. Thank you, um, Honorable Whip Chair. And then I'll now give to Honorable Mkachwa. Hope uh, you being sick, you are able to speak at least. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Honorable Iti. <clears throat> and good afternoon, good morning to all um, colleagues on the platform. Uh, thank you to yourself and the WIP for holding the fort. Um, I think comrades and colleagues have been doing a great job. Um, I, I think perhaps let me start with the issues around migration. Um, maybe, I, I don't know, colleagues, just looking at the dates, I'm a bit concerned on um the time of which it's taken to to finalize the migra migration right and maybe dg together with yourselves and the team colleagues from planning colleagues uh um, who are responsible for skills can can help us understand right um whether or not genuinely if we were to reflect if um the time that has that it has taken to to finalize migration has been acceptable, or if we could have done it within a shorter period of time, um, I, I don't know. Uh, colleagues can assist me, and perhaps also if colleagues then, uh, if there are particular bottlenecks that um, have been experienced by colleagues in this particular process of migration. Uh, and, and perhaps the intervention of the committee could assist maybe through a joint sitting with um, agriculture and um, as well as health, um, then maybe, you know, colleagues can share with us if there is a need for us to assist as a committee on that level. Um, maybe even through further discussions with our colleagues from the NCOP as they do their direct work with um, the provincial departments. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to think um, on how we can conclude this matter quicker. Um, and I really want to therefore also support the um, the the request by the WIP that we have a, a, a roadmap. But I want to further say it must be dated. You know, um, this committee is very big on firstly taking us through the details of time frames so that we can, you know, see if we are on track. Um, but also, uh, we want to get to a, a, a day zero in terms of this particular migration. So we must commit ourselves to a particular date uh, and work towards achieving that and work towards supporting one another in overcoming whatever bottlenecks that may be experienced. So, so DG, together with your team, maybe you can take us through that. And then um, I just want to also then... Um, uh, just also maybe express my concerns in relation to the agricita um, and and implementation of the recommendations from the OMA report. Um, and maybe if colleagues could make us understand why, for example, um, certain recommendations would not have been implemented, um, for example, in relation to 
um, the recommendation that uh, criminal charges should be laid um, on or against Ms. Muloto and Grimeti, um, HR Solutions. You know, if colleagues can make us understand how they got to a point where then there was this, um, this, uh, I think it was a mutual agreement for, for you know, uh, colleagues to then, uh, well, what they call a, a, a separation package. Um, how did we get to that as opposed to what had been initially recommended? Um, and then perhaps bring us into confidence in how we are or how, how we have or how we are putting in place systems to ensure that what happened in the case of um, uh, Ms. Moloto um, and, and Kirimeti, uh, HR Solutions and all the other colleagues who are also involved in this particular matter and how we are putting in place systems to mitigate uh, such from re reoccurring um, at the CETA because that for us becomes really essential. And I think Honorable Maneniso did allude to this to say that uh, what are we doing to ensure that uh, this does not happen again. Um, yeah, and I think it would be important then colleagues for us then to be brought into confidence around this, this, this particular uh, recommendation, which spoke to the review of termination policies and procedures for all employees to regulate employees who resign after committing acts of misconduct as well as the payment of their salaries and benefits under such circumstances. And I think, um, you know, some of the sentiments of the committee at times is that, but how are people so come, like, so we are, we're in the pool, huh? and then, you know, you resign and the, you know, there's a separation and then that's it. It's like, what then becomes the repercussions? Of your put of 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 your wrongdoings besides just resigning because I, I think resigning is almost like a, a, a even more comfortable position to be in because you don't have to deal with the consequences of your wrongdoings so yeah maybe colleagues can just assist us in how they've attempted to put in systems um, to uh, to to respond to that. Honorable Litsi, I think I'll leave it at that for now. I think colleagues um, have by and large covered me. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Kachwa. On the chat, uh, Honorable King has a few questions. Um, the first one is, what is the intake on average per year of nurses at universities and Tibet colleges. Have HWC conducted research on reason for decline in the uptake of nursing and of professional healthcare workers leaving South Africa for other countries? Can a report be given to us on those courses, un unaccredited uh, courses in agriculture and nursing sector to avoid issues of Walter's Sulu University? Are the two sitters experiencing any challenges with regards to issues of certification? <coughs> Those are um, uh, questions from Honorable King. She did indicate that um, she has uh, network issues um, and therefore uh, she has opted to use the chat. Look, um, uh, DG, good uh, morning to yourself. Um, um, uh, I, 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 you know, I was trying to check here on, on the system. Sorry, man, I've got flu as well. Uh, yesterday I was uh, um, near Honorable Mukacha in Parliament, so I think, uh, uh, you know, I might have uh, gotten flu there. Um, <clears throat> so, DG, on the platform, we don't have the DDG of skills, um, skills branch. Uh, I've not seen him. Uh, or you sit there with you. 
Um, uh, good, uh, good morning, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. We've got Mr. Mabuza Ngubane, who's yeah. standing in for DDG Mvalo, who's uh, in, in, in Devon representing us uh, in, the, in the graduation of, um, of some kind. So he's represented uh, by the Chief Director for CETA Coordination, Mr. Mabuza Ngubane. <coughs> okay, no, thank you very much, uh, DJ. Are you back in the country? You, you, you are using a different background. Well, uh, to my questions, uh, I think uh, colleagues would have covered me extremely well uh, on on many um, questions um, that I would have had. I had. Uh, about um, you know, a, a liver liver file full of questions uh, myself, and I think colleagues from Mumsby uh, to Honorable Boshoff, uh, Mamanani, so took the bulk of them, and um, um, Honorable, Honorable Whip and the Chair uh, took uh, some of them. Maybe let me start with the. Uh, with a statement um, to both our sitters, health and welfare and agricultural seat. Generally, there's a perception that um, our people who are employed in this sitters we fraud the institutions um, and then because uh, we have invented commas, they are our people, we protect them. As a result uh, of that, uh, we're unable to take to um, um, crime and defeat the nation that uh, uh, our, we use our citizens for wrong things. A case in point, in my view, is what uh, I think Ronald uh, Mukart was. Um, talking about our husband, Sutter, <coughs> about... I'm sorry, we can't hear you, Herblitz, here. I actually think you got kicked out of the meeting. But I will cut for a second. Uh, honorable, that's it. Actually, we can hear all the blitz at all. You can uh, hear even now. It's better now, Honorable. Uh, you can hear even now. Okay, my it's better now. We, we didn't hear you in the first part. We can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, it's a, I was. Uh... You know, I don't understand this thing. Um, and uh, can you hear me now? Yes, Honorable. Let's see, we can hear you now. Oh, thank you very much. I don't understand this thing. You know, all along I was not speaking, and then it was not coming. It was not cutting me. Now I'm talking about uh, uh, the Omar report. You know, network cuts me. I, I think maybe it's a sign <laughs> that uh, there are certain things we're not supposed to speak about. But on a serious note, uh, I was saying I don't know whether you've heard any part of of my statement where I said. 
uh, there's a general perception that we do protect uh, our people in our cities who commit an act of uh, crime or fraud or whatever. Uh, and with the Omar report, the case in point, um, when I was actually disappointed, I, was, I, I waited uh, to hear the chair of, of, of um, the board there. You know, I waited, I wanted to hear uh, if she will get to it, and she did not, which was um, sort of a disappointment a little bit to me that uh, the chair of the board did not uh, touch on that part. Because I, I think it's, a, it's an important part to start. Um, we have a responsibility, colleagues, to change the narrative in our cities that we, pro we are protecting wrongdoings in our cities. And if we don't do it now, shame, we'll be in trouble. Um, so I, I, I think maybe the first question would be to the chair of council of, uh, of Agricita, why uh, did you not <coughs> um, even mention in the presentation the Omar report um, and why did you resolve uh, um, to finalize uh, the recommendations of the OMA, OMA report uh, different from um, what the the to us, what the the recommendation would have been in the report. Uh, maybe take us through so that we we understand um, the decisions that you guys have taken there. On the same breath, um, uh, health and welfare center, um, about six weeks or so ago, uh, uh, I was uh, I was um, approached by some general public uh, people who uh, made allegations about your one of your service providers. <coughs> they one of your service providers called Zigna or something like that. That uh, Zigna, it appears that this service provider you had appointed and. Um, this service provider would have claimed uh, money from the health and welfare seat, saying that they are training this learners. But these learners have never been trained for three years. So how they, they, they get to this conclusion is when the president announced the 350 last year of 2020, for the unemployed youth. They went to apply. So when they get there, uh, they are told that, oh, well, well, now you can't get because you are employed uh, by so-and-so. They try to follow up. They are being frustrated from last year. And this is what they allege. Um, until uh, somehow they then sent us this uh, um, email. Uh, so we go through their emails and we, 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 we then say, no, man, uh, this can't be right because uh, this might be two or three uh, kids, but the program was for 1,000 kids. So what if this company has been claiming money from this defrauding the seat of uh, 
millions of runs every month, whatever, lying to the to the health and welfare center that they are training this learners, can they? They are not. So let's follow up this thing. Because it's public funds there. We have a responsibility to protect the public funds. So I made um, contact with the um, the CEO of uh, Health and Welfare City, Mebras, and uh, informed her of this thing. And then uh, she then uh, promised to get back to me, but she will investigate really what happened. So, um, so we don't know what is the status of that investigation. How far are they with that investigation? So maybe the, this is an opportune time for them to um, give us a, a response on that part. Um, now, this one that I've just said, and the OMA report, uh, because the OMA uh, report, uh, if you remember, it was the public protectors it came from a public protector's um, um, one of the pub, public protector's releases or whatever they call them, um, suggests that uh, our systems uh, in this CITAS might not be watertight the way we want them to be. Because the CETA might uh, be doing the right thing and um, uh, trying to train uh, our kids on different skills that are needed in the economy. And service providers might be submitting reports to the CETA that are not accurate, that are manufactured. Um, and we might be asking ourselves, why after we have trained our kids, they can't be absorbed in the system, uh, you know, blaming each other. Maybe it's uh, our accreditation, maybe it's the quality of the skills we offer. Can they, uh, the service providers are not even providing training to this unemployed youth. So which means we need to tighten up um, the monitoring aspect of it. Um, it means we ought to find ways, maybe this thing of manual uh, register, manual registers are not working. You know, where we ask them or no, they submit the report with attendance registers, then we pay. Maybe that thing is not working. Maybe we ought to now think outside of the box so that we we protect those who are on the other side, the, 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 those who are supposed to be beneficiaries. Uh, but we also protect uh, state resources against uh, um, uh, people who might want to, you know, Steal because if you say to me, <coughs> so if you say to me, you are going to train uh, 500 kids and you are not training them, you are training three kids, and but you are claiming for five, 500, you are stealing. That is theft. So we must uh, we must find a way. So so the numbers that have been presented to us today. Um, uh, DG and uh, and the Dengubano standing for the DDG might not even be a true reflection of what of, of the work that has been done uh, on those numbers. It might be those are the numbers the sitters have, but those are not the true reflection of those who have been trained. Because I've just made an example of this uh, Zigna Kamban that uh, claimed to have been training people, and some of them have not been trained. Uh, and worse, they've not even received 
uh, their stipends. So somebody would have claimed from the CETA, and wow, I'm hoping that we'll get that report. Uh, somebody would have claimed from the CETA, claiming to be paying these kids, and these kids have not been paid. Uh, that person would have claimed for, what do you call this thing, management fee from the CETA on managing these kids, then they've not managed anything. Serious corruption. So I'm interested in this report uh, from Health, Health and Welfare uh, CETA. Um, so the numbers that we have now here um, might not really be a true reflection of the real numbers on the ground. So it then uh, forces me to make a suggestion to yourselves, uh, uh, to the sitters, uh, the DG, but to you maybe in the Dungubani there, to share with the, your DDG, uh, maybe, you know, combined, combine your, your, your thinking, you know, on this one. So that uh, maybe we we find ways of of uh, clamping down of um, of uh, on, on corruption and fraud. Um, that maybe you guys must develop um, a monitoring system that will be able to. Uh, detect uh, when learners are not being taught, even if they are in deep rural KwaZulu Natal, the north of KwaZulu Natal, or, or or in the east of the Eastern Cape, deep deep rural, we should be able to get a system where we are able to monitor without. Uh, uh, the service providers, if learners are being uh, are being trained, <coughs> um, because if we don't, we will then continue to pay service providers money they don't deserve, uh, money they, that we are supposed to pay them for training learners, and they've not trained any of them. You know. Um, uh, you know, it can be, you know, uh, two weeks or three weeks ago, if you remember, uh, DJ, we had uh, the LG CETA with us. And the report they gave us there was that they, they've given the CEO um, protection because the assessment is that his, uh, his life is in danger for uncovering corrupt activities at, uh, at the LGC. Now, uh, public protector found something here at agri uh, It was the services CETA previous CEO also at uh, private security. Uh, there's this one of Zigna at uh, health and welfare CETA. So the, the we 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 can't be called uh, or we can't be accused of exaggerating when we say there's a perception at the sitters that things are not right. My worry is that the AG's report on health and welfare sitters said everything is fine. Training providers, trained learners and they were paid on time. Now we're uncovering that those learners were not trained. They were never paid. So it means even our systems of auditing here, uh, internal audit, uh, you know, seems to be lacking somewhere and also external with the AG. So can they, can they you know, can we leave here being assured that these things are going to be attended to. Can we leave here uh, being assured that um, we are going to attend to these things of uh, corruption and fraud and, and all of those things? 
as a matter of uh, of agents. So um, uh, th those would have been my contribution. Like I said, uh, other members would have covered me. So I only concentrated on this one part uh, of uh, the images of, of our sitters there. So I'm going to give uh, DG, I'm going to give back to yourself. And then you are going to direct um, how you guys respond there. And then when you are done with the department, we'll go to Agresita, a chair of council. I'm not sure if you will cover everything or you'll also give uh, uh, to your colleagues there in management. And then we'll go to health and welfare CETA. We'll start with the chair of, of, chair of the board and then uh, go to management. In that order, DG. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I also take this opportunity to thank uh, the, the, the Chair of the Portfolio Committee, who's not well, and, and we share very well. We trust that uh, uh, we, we get her back uh, in, in full fitness as we know her, including yourself, Chair. Uh, I can go on to Lalaba Fanash. We Dr. Sokrikwa and Mr. Mabuza will start and then uh, we will conclude um, uh, from the department's uh, side. Uh, Thank you. Um, thank you, DG. Um, indeed, uh, Chair, uh, I, I don't think we, or anyone can argue we need to have a roadmap uh, with timelines um, and a, possibly a project office that would uh, look at to the earliest execution of, of this uh, mammoth project. Um, and so uh, I can reassure you, uh, we will look at that uh, as soon as possible. Um, particularly uh, given the, the, the fact that it, it, it really, as you've indicated, it, it really has been um, a rather protracted process. Uh, so there's no denying that um, we must establish a formulator roadmap uh, with all the relevant stakeholders um, uh, and uh, one look at doing that. Um, let me state up front, uh, I'm not too certain about the costing of um, uh, execution of this project, but uh, we will, once we've established a project management office or capability uh, for this particular uh, migration project, uh, one will be able to generate those figures. Um, on the issue of autonomy raised by Honorable uh, 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 Bashkov, um, any college is entitled, that is incorporated into the envelope of higher education is entitled to the same level of autonomy as all the other institutions. So that autonomy is in no way uh, reduced or compromised um, it is protected by legislation. Um, so I wish to give you the assurance uh, that um, the, the colleges uh, will not be uh, treated differently from the other institutions. They are equal, uh, equal in every respect in the higher education world. Then in terms of the a uh, question around demographics, uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, we, we will uh, improve how we present that data. I think the point is relevant um, as we uh, presented the province um, in our presentation. Um, and then into the, uh, on, on the point of the 
um, management of the uh, colleges across different provinces that others are doing well than others. Um, certainly, that would be so cheap uh, because they are operating at a provincial level. However, once they're incorporated into the national envelope of higher education, there are certain regulations that they have to align themselves with. One of those examples is uh, submitting uh, financial integrity data um, annually uh, to the department. Uh, the other is about um, allowing themselves to be, uh, um, to be monitored. The sites uh, should be compliant. Um, and um, the other would be obviously also speaking to the level of enrollment. So all of those regulations, uh, the accreditation of the programs that they have, all those regulations will, will start to apply. Um, in relation to the question about the uh, phased approach, uh, indeed, with the project management office, uh, uh, we would be tracking um, uh, the different phases uh, more uh, uh, accurately, uh, including um, tracking around the um, transfer of uh, staff, uh, which is a very sensitive matter. Um, and I think that is the reason why National Treasury insisted on further consultation. You can imagine in, uh, uh, in some instances, it will be migrating, the, uh, you know, you'd need to have uh, 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 budget provisions for migrating staff uh, from one province to another. Those relocation costs uh, need to be preceded by a, a reasonable level of, of consultation. Um, then on the issue of uh, the uh, feasibility, uh, we certainly will share that report with you. Um, I've made a note uh, uh, on that request. Um, the funding strategy is something we would need to uh, complete with National uh, 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 Treasury. Um, and as you know, Chair, we are busy with a funding model um, uh, for the universities and uh, TVET sector. Um, so, uh, and that particular model is uh, due um, within the next two months. Um, but it, it certainly has not uh, started to look at the, uh, at the colleges, uh, but we will incorporate it as part of the uh, project for uh, 2023. On uh, issues of uh, our relationship with NESFAS, uh, Chair, our relationship with NESFAS is very good. Uh, we have regular meetings with NESFAS. In fact, NESFAS is a key uh, 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 stakeholder in our um, CE model policies, as well as the funding model that we are uh, currently uh, preoccupied with. Um, and with the other departments, uh, Chair, as I indicate, uh, indicated earlier, we have established uh, the joint uh, committee, steering committees, um, and uh, in particular, the uh, steering committee with health meets uh, much more regularly, um, uh, and with time, uh, we, we will uh, uh, revive the uh, steering committees for for, for agriculture colleges. We, we encountered a, a few bridges, um, particularly around, uh, I would interpret as resistance from the uh, council, um, but I will certainly, uh, uh, together with my uh, team, uh, ensure that we address um, uh, those engagements, uh, revive those engagements. Um, lastly, Chair, um, on the, the, the role of uh, National Treasury, uh, certainly National Treasury is central uh, uh, to, to this entire migration process. Uh, firstly, uh, in terms of advice they provide us on the transfer of the funding, and as I indicated earlier, that funding is not being transferred to DHIT. The funding is transferred to our sister departments. And uh, from provincial to national uh, is something that really sits squarely uh, with national treasury. Uh, so we will continue to be guided by them. 
on how this should proceed. Um, and then uh, lastly, on the uh, question around um, asset management, um, the transfer thereof, again, uh, we need to work very closely with a, a, a Department of Public Works, um, and they're de totally dependent on, on, on the, the, the uh, guidelines um, and, and provisions. Um, I, I may just quickly illustrate that um, there is a, a process one needs to undertake, um, and that is, um, for example, on our own um, uh, relocation of the department. So um, we we are quite mindful um, that we cannot bypass them. Um, they are a key stakeholder. And uh, when the project management uh, office is established, we will ensure that um, it incorporates um, uh, public works as a, as a critical stakeholder in this process. Um, I think I should, uh, oh, there, no, there was a question on accreditation uh, and how far that process is. Um, J, uh, CHE has been uh, sterling in their cooperation, uh, uh, particularly with the college, uh, nursing colleges. They have provided a, a, a requisite accreditation where it is possible. Uh, where it is not possible, uh, they did not provide it. And I, I listed where uh, the, the accreditation where it was possible, or uh, where the, the uh, programs could be uh, uplifted uh, and, and, and uh, offered at our education level. Um, uh, and, and, and of course, we meet regularly with uh, CHE um, and uh, the uh, uh, SAQA, um, uh, particularly uh, because we, we want to ensure that uh, our students have confidence in the programs that we offer. Um, and then there was a, a comment on the impact of COVID. Um, Certainly, uh, Chair, bearing in mind that this project started in 2011, um, the hiccups introduced by COVID, that is uh, particularly around uh, the, um, uh, the supply chain of transferring the assets, uh, I think that must have impacted severely. Um, but we will, we will, once the project management office is established, uh, sure that we make provision for um, the different stages of this migration uh, properly. So uh, please allow me, Chair, that um, in the interim uh, to, to, to set up um, this vehicle, uh, which I think is best suited uh, to, to look at the migration. Um, I will stop there for now and hand over to my colleague to uh, speak to the issues of um, uh, the CETA. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Chairperson. If I can come in, I'm Mabu Zangubane. Honorable Chairperson, Portfolio Committee, Com Committee Members, DG, CETA Chairpersons and CEOs and DHET Senior Managers, greetings to everyone. Um, I just wanted to note and appreciate the inputs that were submitted. Uh, I will talk to the inputs that directly relate uh, to the department, the skills development branch on behalf of the DG Mval. I wanted to make a commitment that we will follow through all the issues uh, that were raised among others, which includes uh, coming up with a comprehensive career guidance document that uh, presents all careers within various sectors that are supported by the CITAS. The other issue that was raised is the need for the review of the CITA employer employee separation and termination policy, which must be developed to regulate the issues of resignations by those who are facing investigations for misconduct. I think that is a, a critical point which will also need to be looked at because indeed it is correct that at present when the CETA officials are facing serious charges or investigations of corruption and misconduct, the 
they generally put their resignations and then the cases that becomes the end of the cases uh, against them. That will be looked at. And then the reports that has been requested by the portfolio committee members, the Sigma training provider report for health and welfare CETA, as well as the OMA report from agri -CETA. I undertake that as the department, we will follow up and follow through to ensure that such reports are made available to the portfolio committee. But coming uh, up to the issue of uh, tightening up the CETA internal control measures to address corruption and also to improve the monitoring of CETA projects. One member raised this issue uh, emphatically. Uh, I do want to appreciate the input and also just outline what the department at present have in place that we use to monitor uh, the CETA projects. One, over a few years, we came up with a set means of CETA management information system, which was meant to report all the CETA projects that are implemented by CETAs. We had hoped that this information will enable us to extract the, the, the information or extract the reports, which are reliable and valid for reporting purposes. It is a fact that even though the system is in, in place, but there has been teething problems, we are not yet at the required level of uh, getting a reliable and a valid information from the system, but we continue to monitor the implementation of that system. But the other intervention from the department side is the skills development branch. On a quarterly basis, we collect the CETA quarterly performance reports that are submitted to us. After a receipt of those quarterly monitoring reports, we analyze them and randomly extract a sample through which the departmental team will go to the seat and validate that information. And if there are any gaps between what is reported by the CETA and the evidence that is found in the CETA when we are conducting the validation at the CETA level, we do provide the feedback and indicate the gaps uh, which we require the CETA to fill up. And before any quarterly monitoring report is formally concluded, we also direct all the CETA CEOs to formally write it to the department, confirming the information that has been submitted or reported to the department. But uh, beyond that, uh, we have a, a CETA performance validation framework in place that we also use to guide how CETA inf performance information should be reported to the department. And we also have a CETA governance charter and standards, which prescribes the minimum governance standards, which all CETAs must have in place to ensure that CETA governance is improved. And we uh, conducted the monitoring of the implementation of such, of, of such uh, governance standards on a quarterly basis. And if there is some information that is missing, we make sure that uh, the CETA uh, address such information. I'll make the example of what our CETA governance standards covers. Each and every CETA is expected to have an audit action plan in place to address the AG findings. And the, that audit action plan also is submitted to the department for monitoring and reporting purposes. All CETA accounting authorities are expected to sign the declarations of interest before all the meetings of allocation of discretionary grants and mandatory grants. As one of the minimum standards, we also have directed all CETAs to make sure that the record keeping is proper uh, at CETAs by keeping the records of all the meetings and the resolutions of the accounting authority meetings. Each committee of the CETA from the accounting authority up to the subcommittees that exist uh, within the CETAs are expected to operate in accordance to their terms of reference as well as the CETA standard constitution. 
Also, the commitment registers of the sitters, we expect those to be in place and to be monitored by uh, the accounting authority. I was just highlighting some of the measures that uh, we have put in place to ensure that uh, we strengthen uh, the internal control measures to monitor the CETA performance and governance. But on the other hand, we do appreciate uh, the fact that when dealing with or when monitoring the CETA performance, we must look at it holistically, both uh, looking at how the CETA perform in meeting its predetermined objectives or the targets in the service level agreement, as well as the annual performance plan. And that must correlate with the state of CETA governance in terms of meeting the Auditor General requirements. In other words, if a CETA obtains an unqualified audit report or a clean audit from the Auditor General, the expectation from the department side is that that should not be the end of the road. The expectation that if the CETA is, perform is doing well in terms of its governance, the performance also must be in line with the governance of, of that CETA. That is our view, but I wanted to end by undertaking to follow up and follow through all, all the issues that has been raised, that they will all be looked at with the intention to improve the CETA performance and the CETA governance. And the, there will be a report back to my DDG uh, so that we'll be able to come up with the measures on improving the CETA governance and the performance. Thank you very much, Shepesi. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and thanks to, to my two colleagues. Um, if you allow me, Chair, I just wish to make two uh, 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 key uh, issues around the questions because uh, Honorable uh, Mananiso had um, very crucial questions that were asked. And uh, uh, when Honorable Mkacha uh, had an opportunity, she also indicated that it's a line of questions that um, she would have asked and, and Honorable Letsi also the same. And our response to that has been that uh, we see this as part of the uh, request at a, um, uh, you know, you know, you know, a roadmap that, uh, you know, we will present covering all those issues. I trust that this um, is clear in, in our response so that it doesn't seem like we have not covered those issues. There, there is a specific question that was asked by Honorable Bosov uh, that relates to the autonomy of agricultural colleges, uh, which I thought that was well responded to by uh, Dr. Sopriko, but I do wish to just emphasize that uh, once these institutions um, are registered, uh, they, all the, the uh, prescripts uh, uh, of the regulations apply to them uh, and there are no, no exceptions. And therefore, um, that would be our, our response. Uh, I think that uh, in the emphasis that uh, Dr. Bosov has raised um, is suggested that it's important that we take note of the progress that the institutions would have made in the past um, and 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 build from that uh, instead of dropping the good work that has been done, particularly work uh, to establish a, a strong uh, social compact uh, with the stakeholders and so, uh, social partners in the agricultural sector. Uh, I think uh, our president has uh, emphasized this uh, working with our stakeholders. Our minister does this. Our deputy minister has done this in a number of times. And I think that's the, the, the emphasis that Dr. Sotrikwa has made in her response to the question today, and I support it. Uh, Honorable Sbia uh, uh, you know, asked uh, questions, which Honorable Sbia, notwithstanding the responses we've provided, 
but we will follow through on the issues of uh, career guidance uh, to see how, for example, these institutions could work with CETA, uh, which is our, you know, an, our flagship program that deals with the um, issues of uh, uh, career guidance. Uh, we are re-establishing a scholarship unit uh, in the office of the uh, DG, and, and uh, which works with other government departments to strengthen this area, uh, particularly with a focus on the funding of the um, uh, the, the the missing middle, um, and uh, also awaiting guidelines uh, from the uh, ministerial task team that seeks to review the student funding uh, mod model. All of this is going to inform our approach as we uh, embrace the new agricultural and nursing colleges uh, 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 in collaboration with our counterparts in the Department of Health, as well as uh, the Department of Agriculture. And I think um, that's uh, uh, um, the, 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 so the issues around advertisement of bursaries, um, uh, matters around social auxiliary services, the uh, numbers of people employed will will have to follow government policy and we will monitor this and this is a the emphasis that honorable Letsi makes that we need to strengthen the oversight of the department uh, particularly on all of these matters and make sure that governance uh, continue to improve and i i'm very happy with the response from my colleague um, uh, mabuza as um, uh, Gubane, who's uh, as a chief director is able to articulate uh, our charter for governance that applies to all our our you know you know you know sitters uh, to say that uh, uh, notwithstanding that those are minimum standards but we've got high expectations uh, from our sitters and uh, i think uh, it is expected of us that uh, we align ourselves with government with, with government position on uh, fighting corruption and fighting poor governance in our institutions. And our expectation is that our chairs of uh, and of councils, as well as the CEOs of all our entities, uh, adhere to these uh, principles which the minister, uh, Dr. Blade and Zimande has. Uh, and joined all our institutions, all our public institutions to adhering to as a, as a face of the of government in the sector, uh, in the fight against uh, corruption. And this is an emphasis that Honorable Letsi makes, that uh, there is a, a particular report uh, that what is uh, Honorable Letsi, and, uh, and, and this report, uh, the, the the you know the Omar report and the Zigna uh, you know company that seem seem to uh, you know uh, be getting away with uh, you know uh, of what seems to at initial you know observation be the case but uh, uh, we are going to look at these issues honourable lady uh, with much more um, emphasis that is reflected in your in your statement and uh, and uh, and is stressed in the governance charter of uh, the department that all our sitters adhere to notwithstanding a few issues that are are reported i have to insist that uh, we generally see an improvement of governance amongst our sitters and because of of the of of this uh, uh, work which uh, you know, it also emanate from the oversight of our uh, portfolio committee and other stakeholders. We are we are happy to see, but uh, there is not one incident that's going to escape our gaze. Uh, you know, around the issues that are reported to us, and we thank you very much, uh, yourself and on all honourable members that have asked us questions. Um, uh, honourable Mashati, um did emphasize the roadmap. On, on migration issues, of which uh, these were articulated by Honorable Mananiso. Um, I think that uh, uh, the the chair of um, uh, the chair of the of of of, of 
of the uh, uh, HW CETA uh, will 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 respond to the to the questions that uh, um, you know have been have been raised that are specific to 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 this. Uh, Chairperson, I think uh, um, um, I think the chair of Accra CETA, uh, uh, Sharon Sipeng, will 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 make a, a comment, particularly on the the report, uh, the OMA report, uh, which uh, I think it's an important uh, emphasis that has, has been made. Uh, in this regard, Chair, we've also noted your advices in terms of how we could tighten legislation, how we could work with uh, other government departments to speed up. I think the Honorable Chair of the Portfolio Committee makes a point that uh, it has taken quite long uh, for these uh, processes to be finalized, and it's it's not satisfactory uh, the pace. Uh, I, I think we take this uh, uh, very well, uh, Honorable Mkacha. Uh, I'm going to raise this issue with my counterpart in the Department of Agriculture to see how we could uh, advise um, uh, our, our principals to making sure that uh, the issues that are obstinate in this regard are dealt with. Uh, between now and uh, the 1st of uh, April 2023, the biggest issue uh, around the, the issues of, uh, of the agricultural colleges is going to be consultation. This, this consultation, it must be very clear, it's not about officials anymore consulting. We are done with the technical consultation around the issue. These are just at the level of uh, uh, our um, executive authorities to give them an opportunity because in the uh, um, the decision of Treasury in this regard, uh, Treasury felt that we've done a uh, good work of consulting as departments, but not sufficient uh, opportunity has been given for our executive authorities to engage on this issue so that when we implement, we are one government that is focused on only one item and that is service delivery. And I think uh, in the interest of service delivery, this decision was taken. But I think the point about, about how long it has taken, I think the delays were much more when the matter was handled by ourselves in the technical committees. But uh, we, 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 we are going to uh, look into these issues carefully, Chair, and uh, at, as and when you request us to account on them we will be we will do so as you as you direct us and we thank you for your guidance uh, chairperson uh, if you allow me uh, i will hand back to you before our colleagues in this two seaters uh, present and uh, with your permission uh, if you allow me i will i will allow the the two colleagues uh, to to um, be excused uh, if this is uh, in order chair It's an order, um, Dr. Sishi. Um, thank you very much uh, from the department. Um, can we now go to WNR? Uh, sorry to Agresita. Um, sorry, I was just accepting people in the waiting room. Um, Agresita, Chair of Cancer. Thank you, Honourable Chair. Um, I would like to first to start by apologizing for not maybe bringing the OMA report, but um, our presentation was just guided by what was sent to us as a, as a breakdown of the status quo of the institution. But I'm going to, however, going to ask our company secretary um, who has been here to to give us a, to, to give um, a, a background about this report. This is a 2013 report, and he's been here as a company secretary even longer than that. And then he'll be able to can give us guidance on that on that OMA report. And I would like just to answer some questions from Honorable Mananusi in terms of our 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 executive skills, uh, um, our qualifications. Um, myself. There's a chairperson of the board. I have master's in business administration. And 
uh, the, the CEO of the institution has PhD. Uh, the the uh, CFO is, is a chartered accountant. Uh, Mr. Fosher has MBA, who is the executive manager for skills planning and research. Mr. Shabangu, who is the executive for learning programs. He's also having masters. Dr. Letualo, who is a corporate um, a, a services executive. She has also a PhD. Uh, Mr. Peta also has MBA. Uh, Mr. Ndlanga, who is a company secretary, also has LLB. That is uh, basically the, the, the background of our qualifications in the, in the institutions within our management. Uh, I'm going to ask um, a company secretary to, to give us a, just a, a, a brief report and it shall be forwarded to you, uh, Chair, uh, in, in a detailed report further will be forwarded to you in terms of the outcomes and all the reports that I've been happening within the investigations that have been happening within the institution, being it an SIU report or anything. Um, we, we are trying our best as the current board to be as transparent as we can and to give as much information as possibly needed so that we can, we can see that we are trying to tackle corruption from all angles and we're trying our best to be as fair and transparent as we can. And um, may I ask company secretary to, to maybe to give this one on the, on the, on the, on the, on the OMA report for the 2013 report. Company secretary, over to you. To you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and uh, good afternoon to all the members of the committee. Um, I'll be brief, Chair. <clears throat> The report on OMA, OMA was the uh, internal auditors at the time uh, uh, for Acrisita. The report uh, is dated 2012. So if you count now, that would be 10 years, uh, if I count correctly. In fact, it's dated June 2012. So the report on OMA, which will be forwarded to the committee, uh, made all the findings that the chairperson has uh, alluded to, uh, including recommendations of the uh, criminal charges that had to be opened against uh, certain managers at the time. Uh, my response, Chair, is to say briefly, <clears throat> these recommendations, Chair, were implemented. Uh, I have personally accompanied the former CEO who had taken over from that other CEO who had left. There is a case number, Chairperson, with the uh, Hawks. The case was opened in 2019. The case was opened against the former CEO who was here in 2012, as well as Ms. Moloto, including Ms. Moloto's company, Kitty Metz. So that matter is before the Hawks, Chairperson. From Agricita side, uh, the previous board uh, did uh, uh, implement those recommendations. But it's very important, Chair, to highlight that the report or the board, the previous board, implemented those recommendations after having received a, a, a report of the public protect. So I don't want to dwell too much, Chair. The two reports will be forwarded. Uh, to the committee and uh, committee members will get enough time to study uh, the two reports. But I wanted to respond to that part that the, the, the criminal charges were opened against uh, the members that had been mentioned. Secondly, Chair, <clears throat> there was also a recommendation that this Kidimete company must be blacklisted through National Treasury so that it does not get to do business with the state again. Again, on this one, Chair, this matter was uh, implemented, this recommendation. Uh, also, Chair, in terms of the PFMA, you don't just go and uh, open uh, and request Treasury to blacklist someone. You also need to inform the company or the person who must be blacklisted. So we've got a letter, Chair, uh, where Ms. Moloto, where Agricita wrote to Ms. Moloto to say the intention is to blacklist your company 
from doing business with the state based on the findings of this report. So we've got that information. And we also have the letter where we wrote to National Treasury and actually requested National Treasury to blacklist this company from doing business with the state. So those are the recommendations that have been implemented here. <clears throat> there was also <clears throat> a question uh, that the DG had responded to, as well as Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Mubane from DHEAD uh, on Acrisita allowing people the so-called golden handshakes. So I can briefly, without uh, in less than a minute, Chair, explain that part. The, the CEO who was here at the time was left with six months in his employment with the Acrisita. So the board at the time in 2017, uh, after the board had found out about this OMA report, they then interrogated the CEO about the report and there was a lot of issues there. And that's what led to the board to charge the former CEO. <clears throat> so it was at the time between the disciplinary hearing of that CEO, that's when he resigned. That was 2017. So what happened there was that the CEO entered into an agreement to part ways with Agricita. And what he was paid, Chair, he was paid the remainder of his contract, which was six months. Uh, it's very important, Chair, that I must mention that uh, the payment of the remainder of his contract came with conditions from the board. One condition was that the monies that uh, the CEO had sort of used without the authority of the board, those monies needed to be uh, taken from his pension. So it was not uh, just a clear cut case of him getting a golden handshake. So the board at the time felt that uh, it was important just to part ways with him, considering that his contract was also coming to an end. Um, there was also a recommendation, Chair, that uh, Akrisida needed to, after the, the, the parting of ways, that Akrisida needed to review its own policies to make sure that something like this, where an employee is charged, and then that employee is paid, that that must come to an end. I can confirm, Chair, that uh, the organizational policies get reviewed every year from the responsible uh, board committees and they go to the board for approval. None of the policies, employment policy, be it HR within the organization makes provision for anyone to be paid or paid out. Uh, when that person is facing a disciplinary action. Um, yeah, I think those are the three questions, Chair, that I thought it was important uh, to highlight. Also, uh, the board that we have currently, this is my last response, Chair. This board, uh, none of the members now, currently in the board, we're here at the time that all these issues uh, took place. These are old uh, matters, Chair, dating back to 2008 and 2009. So this board was appointed uh, from the 1st of April 2020. Uh, they have only been in office uh, for a period of two years now. And the CEO that we have currently started on the 1st of December, 2020. Uh, this board chair has done everything to ensure that all the recommendations and they continue to respond to all the matters that relates to the historical issues that I've mentioned of SIU, public protector. So we've got all the information chair, the letters that we wrote to the public protector, the reports, so that information, Chair, as Mr. Ngubane from TH has indicated, we will package that information correctly and make sure that the Portfolio Committee does get that information. Uh, thank you, Chairperson.
Thank you so much, Company Secretary. Um, with regards to the, the, the remaining questions, I'm going to request our CEO of the board, Dr. Sirova, to respond to the remaining questions. Thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Sirova. Uh, thank you very, very much to the honorable members, uh, honorable chair for allowing us an opportunity to come and present what uh, our CETA is basically doing. So there was a question that has come through honorable CBA chair earlier on, who indicated on the issues of career, on the issues of uh, career guidance, how many the bursaries, how much we spend, how is it done? How does the CETA administer uh, such bursaries? One chair, our target on the number of exhibitions, we target basically indeed to schools, those who are in grade nine as they prepare their exit level within the general education system. And around there, we have about four career days in collaboration with the Tibet colleges. Uh, but besides that, we also have uh, working in collaboration with DHEAD, we, we do about 20 exhibitions, particularly in rural areas uh, where we, we know for sure that the challenges are there. Are there. Amongst others, uh, because we invite the schools in rural areas, uh, we have found some schools without even agriculture as a subject in the schools. And that's where we come in and try to advise the school management team on the importance of having agriculture in that particular school uh, for those that are located in the rural areas. Uh, some are much closer to the agricultural colleges and, and you find that there's no uh, agriculture in that high school. So those are what we basically do. So how we do the bursaries on the external, we do it through the funding window, which we advertise. It was initially September, October, and now from the 1st of August, we, we uh, advertise. And the total spend there, it's around 17.8 million, which uh, for postgraduates, wherein we are targeting 280 as a number, uh, per, and we find 63,600. And when it comes to the undergraduate, our target is 923. And uh, the amount, maximum amount for a year is 39,750, which brings to a total contribution of 36.6 million uh, in the year. We are also targeting through partnerships uh, with Tibet colleges, universities, and the University of Technologies on how we can increase basically what we are currently doing. We want to thank uh, Chairperson Honorable uh, Mananiso for, for appreciating the presentation uh, done by the chair that we have as Agresita. However, we would not sit down on the laurels. We feel that there's much that still needs to be done. Um, and she raised the issue chair on the relationship with the NESFAS and other institutions of higher learning which I indicate that indeed we have. And recently we just had a meeting with Honorable Minister Nzimande and uh, DDG together with the team. And he appreciated that he feels as a CETA we have uh, less budget and more can be done within our space wherein he directed uh, the DG to lead the team with the CEO and consult N N N NSF with the possibility of getting a funding for extra 500 uh, interns that can be placed in various areas, just to show that uh, we, we are capable of uh, monitoring such and ensure that they are uh, placed a uh, chairperson and we, we shall continue to work with the DG until that part is, is basically done. The issue on the 4AR policy chair that was raised as well by Honorable Mananiso. So we accept that we have started a program with the uh, agricultural colleges where they are piloting uh, that part with a view that when we are done and the project is successful, we'll then roll it out and increase the numbers. Uh, 
So that is, that is where we are. So we brought this initiative of Connect uh, that you have seen when the chairperson made a presentation. Our thinking has been as presented by the chair that students who have agricultural colleges, uh, agricultural qualifications, both attained at the universities and Tibet colleges are able to register there. That's why we targeted 3,000. And we are continuing to talk with our commodity organizations to look for the students who qualify there and do the, the matching in that particular uh, system. So we have targeted that number by December 2022. And as and when we move to this, uh, 2023, we shall be increasing, uh, we shall be increasing the number. Um, amongst others, Chair, we have spoken with the, we have taken an initiative to the board on agricultural student, uh, agricultural sector student fund, wherein we are saying to the commodity organizations that our bursaries are not enough. Let those organizations contribute extra. We then found out that we don't have a policy for such. We had to put a policy, uh, send such to the board. So we are busy working with it, but we, we are seeing an interest from our commodity organizations on how they want to contribute to such funds, uh, which would be over and above what we are receiving funding for. So we shall provide a, an update at a later stage when it has taken a better shape, Chair. We then have the issues uh, on the monitoring and evaluation that was, that was raised. I know the chairperson of the session raised it very strongly on the perception that uh, there's uh, corrupt activities within the CETA, people are being paid, there's no monitoring. What we have done for ourselves, Chair, we, we have targeted for the current financial year, that, for the financial year that has just ended in March, 35% uh, of all the projects that we have within, and we send the team internally to go and monitor whether what is on paper is in line with what has happened exactly, just to avoid what the uh, chairperson of the session, honorable chair has just indicated. And we monitored 35% of those of programs that are above 500,000 500, rands and left those that were a little bit below. But for the current financial year, we have also targeted the projects that are a little bit less than 500,000 because it is in those small projects where a person is appointed, a company is appointed for 120,000 where in what uh, honorable chairs just indicated that there are things that are happening. So such as and when we progress through the head, we shall provide the report as well. But quarterly, the board has directed the CEO that on a quarterly basis, the board must receive the report on monitoring of the projects, uh, which ones have been monitored, what is happening. Above that chair, we have gone back to 2016 and check, just to try to check how many companies canceled in 2016. What was the reason for cancellation? Why do we need to appoint them uh, going forward if they canceled by then? So we are putting together a report 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, until 2021. That will serve before the Audit and Risk Committee and also the board just to show them that we have the following companies that decided to cancel, these are the reasons that are provided, so that if the reasons are not good enough, we are able to blacklist them working together with the National Treasury, just like we did with the earlier company that the, uh, indicated by the company uh, secretary. And I'm glad the chair has indicated on the qualifications of senior managers and members of the board, just like it was requested, Honorable Chair, we shall provide the report as the chairperson of the board has indicated to honorable members. And Honorable Matlatsi touched the issue, is it possible, what will it take to increase the numbers? Because the issue of creation of employment is basically what as the CETA you are supposed to do. Um, how do we monitor the placement uh, where are the monitoring? So just what we did, Chair, uh, to respond to that, we did a tracer 
study report uh, for projects and that were appointed from 2015 until 2018 financial years. So we did a sample of about 3,554 across seven programs. Yeah, th those programs, the focus was on employed, unemployed learners and those that are self-employed. Just to check amongst others after that tracer study was to check the impact study of the programs, the effectiveness, efficiency, and appropriateness of the programs that AgriCita is basically uh, offering. And those programs included the IT program, bursaries, artisans, graduate placement, internships, and also leadership. And that report, Chair, we shall make it available uh, to yourselves. But amongst the key findings that we had was employed, we found them at 34.8%, self-employed at 7.1%, and 10.7 uh, are studied. So we further asked, out of the programs that we do, how many are completed, the completion of the programs, and we found 81% 80, of the programs that we do are completed and uh, not completed, uh, basically 16, and the other 3% uh, uh, not accounted for. But last on this one, we asked them whether they are satisfied with the programs that Agricit are doing, and we found that 83% of the uh, learners were satisfied. But the question is, are these programs relevant or we are just doing it for the sake of doing it? Though we develop such programs through the sector skills uh, plans with the community organizations, and we found 87% of the learners are satisfied with the programs that Agricita is doing. Such a detailed report chair shall be sent uh, to yourselves. Uh, so that you continue to, to, to guide. So we went to, and the report on the OMA was given in detail uh, as indicated by a company secretary who, who gave a detailed report who, who would also make it available. Chair, thank you so much. We want to appreciate you and continue to take the guidance as and when we are equally invited or do our outreach programs for the learners. So we, you are facing the communities on a daily basis and we think your uh, input are extremely invaluable for us to continue to, to improve. Much appreciated, Honorable Chair. Thank you so much, CEO. Thank you, Honorable Chair. In, in conclusion, as, as the CETA, we like to, to assure the committee that the reports that we've been talking about shall be, shall be forwarded to, to you. And AgroCETA will continue to reach out on our communities because agri agriculture is one of the primary skills that our community needs. As we have seen just during um, COVID, there were a lot of uh, scarcity of food. This can be part, part of lack of training in our communities, can also be contributing to lack of food within our communities in terms of having gardens at, at our homes. But I will say to you in conclusion that we appreciate your, 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 your oversight to us and we're really going to do much and to improve more in terms of what our community needs, what our people need, and what we are supposed to do as an institution. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And I also want to thank the, 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 the DG for always being giving us support and uh, Department of Higher Education. We always would like to appreciate every effort that we are doing to make sure that even our reports are in compliance with what is expected. Thank you so much. Over to you, Chair. Thank you. to you from the trade union. Thank you very much to colleagues from AgriCita. 
Um, I think we can hand over to the next CETA. Honorable Chair, I would really like to appreciate the opportunity that you've been given and also to be um, presented with questions that allows us to look at ourselves and see how we can um, perform better in providing yeah, assurance to, to the portfolio committee. Um, Honorable Chair, I would, I, would, I would request the, the CEO, Mrs. Brass, to give a detailed uh, response on the issues that we raised. However, I would like to just indicate that we, as the chairperson of the board, I would like to um, give the chairperson and the honorable members assurance that we are here um, with the organization, with the HWC to ensure that things are done properly. Of course, not everything is as we would wish, but whatever comes, I would like to assure the, the committee that we do take care of it and address it. And on the issue of the qualifications also, the CEO will give a detailed presentation. I'll just indicate um, the chairperson and the CEO's qualifications. So the chairperson, myself, I am a veterinarian with a Bachelor of Veterinary Science and Medicine, Surgery and Medicine, BVMCH, from the Medical University of Southern Africa, which no longer exists, Medunsa. Uh, I also have a master's in public health from the University of Limpopo, the, Me, the Medunsa campus. And our CEO is a chartered accountant with a BCom in accounting and honors um, in accounting, and she's also passed the PSYCA examination. So um, uh, I can assure you, uh, Honorable Chair, that um, we are led <laughs> properly in the organization and these qualifications that I've just presented and all the others that the CEO is going to present, they've been verified by the SACWA uh, through the appointment processes. I would like to please hand over to the CEO. Thank you, Chair. Mam Nisu, Ungati in a no longer exists. People will say, what happened to that institution? You must say currently referred to as Sifakomo uh, Kato University. Which university is this that you went to that had to close down? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the correction, or I will <laughs> Okay, over to the CEO. Uh, thank you very much, Chairpersons. And with that, I want to then add on to the start of what the Chairperson was communicating in terms of qualifications at the HWC TAM. Uh, we have uh, my Executive Manager of our Research Division, uh, Ma'am Bulawa Plaiki. She has a Master's in Social Work and she is currently a PhD candidate for public administration. Um, Ma'am Zandi Mafata, our CFO, has a BCom to Honours, CTA, and she also holds a secondary teacher's diploma. Um, Mr. Skumbuzu Kavache, who is our executive manager in our skills division, he holds a BA Honours and Master's in Public Management and he's currently also a PhD candidate. And um, I also have two other executives that are not in the room today with us. And they are both also have entered um, the PhD candidacy. And I myself am busy with a master's degree. Uh, what we will do, Chair, is we will submit a list of our executive management, as well as myself, uh, to the committee so that you also have it in writing. Okay, I just want to say thank you so much to the Portfolio Committee. Um, I appreciate the questions that have come through. Uh, we do believe that they are relevant and insightful. In terms of um, the Zigna issue, maybe I should address that uh, first and foremost, as it, it was an opening statement. 
by the chairperson of the committee. And in fact, um, yesterday, I got a report from our ETQA division on the matter. And it, it is a bit uh, complicated. Uh, so first of all, I just want to indicate that as an HWC term, we do not give any funding directly to skills development providers or training providers as sometimes they are referred to. Our funding, all our funding goes through our employers that contribute skills development levies, universities or partners in our sectors. However, those employers or partners may themselves contract an accredited training provider and through the funding we give for the program, they would then get a portion of the funding for training. So relating to the Zigna issue, we were very concerned as an HWC term as to what is actually happening. Um, the ETQA division uh, went into Zigna and had a meeting with them, uh, plus very, various other correspondences. There was a meeting held on the 26th of April uh, to understand and get more information from Zigna. We can confirm that Zigna contracted a company or uh, was contracted by the National Education Group Holdings to recruit and train 1,500 learners. So this is in fact what may be uh, the, the problem. Um, in terms of that, they were training on various um, qualifications, one being a certificate of further education and training in counseling, emergency care, first aid, firefighting and counseling and risk behavior. However, of the 1,500, we have been informed that only 945 were in fact enrolled and training was conducted online because it happened during the COVID-19 restrictions. Most of the learners dropped out due to being disgruntled about the introduction of the 350 Rand grant from the Department of Labor. The circumstances around the grant issue are outside our control, of course, but the provider, Zigna, has indicated the eagerness to continue the training, but the learners are not entertaining this idea. So it, it does really, um, the, this particular circumstances um, is not an HWC to funding. Uh, this was private funding um, that was given to Zigna by the National Education Group Holdings, specifically for certain training. However, the HWC can confirm that Zigna is accredited as an accredited training provider with us, and they have also been approved to offer online training. Uh, we do have um, very strict accreditation policies in place, and also in terms of that policy, uh, we would never allow training of as much as 1,500. We have to ensure that as an accredited training provider, due to uh, your, your premises and, and other criteria, um, and also the number of facilitators you have at hand and so forth, the, the, number, of the, the number that is trained is in fact restricted and controlled. Um, we have also done a, a check through our employers to see if maybe some of our employers may not have also employed uh, Zigna for their training. And uh, from what we can find, um, there has only been a child line and they were funded for 10 learners. So I do not believe that this is actually part of that big group and uh, the current concern at hand. Uh, what we will do is we will continue to, to look into the matter. We will continue to um, do further inquiries and investigations. Um, uh, however, in, in terms of the HWC term, when training does take place, it must take place in terms of our policies 
all those learners have to be loaded onto our ERP system. And then we go out as an ETQA division to do various verifications on those learners. So um, there is a lot of control that we do put in place uh, to ensure that uh, learners are valid um, and quality training has in fact taken place. In line with Zigna, um, on our system, we do not have any registered learning learners uh, to the amount of um, the uh, 1,500 or, or even hundreds of learners. So um, that is where we are, but we certainly, as the Department of Higher Education and Training has indicated, we will um, continue with the investigation and we will give through a formal report to the department who will also submit it uh, to the portfolio committee. Our chair also, um, then following on that, the HWC takes zero tolerance on fraud and corruption. And in fact, the HWC over um, a number of years has in fact dismissed many staff members due to um, misconduct or fraud. Uh, so we take it extremely seriously. Uh, we do report all matters also to the board. However, we do follow a due process in terms of labor law. Um, currently, uh, we, we do not have any matters of uh, fraud um, that has been identified. Um, Early in, actually it was around about March of 2020, uh, through a tip-off, we did identify uh, two staff members in our Eastern Cape office um, where there, there was a tip-off received and that also included a, uh, an employer of the HWC team. We um, investigated it. Uh, we, we had a proper forensic investigation that was conducted. Uh, the conclusion was the two staff members were dismissed and uh, the employer um, was charged. So, the, so there is a police file that has been opened and the matter, matter is also with the SIU. So okay, that, that is how serious the HWC to tax the matters. As uh, the HWC to has indicated, it is not an easy process to blacklist any uh, provider. And it, it is actually a process. And part of that process is in fact writing uh, to the party and indicating of our intention and any reasons why we should not go ahead with the blacklisting. So um, it would be a lot, a lot better for um, public sector if uh, the process of blacklisting a service provider can perhaps be a lot easier. Uh, the HWC has not uh, blacklisted any service providers over the last five years. Um, and in terms of accredited skills development providers, um, if there is violations of any of our accreditation policies or any other policies that are relevant to them, uh, we take action. So uh, we, we do a visitation, uh, we draw up a report, we actually also write to them and give them conditions. If they do not resolve the matters, then we go ahead with de-accreditation processes. Um, so we are also very strict uh, with our accredited training providers. If an accredited training provider has not also met our policy provisions, uh, when their accreditation lapses, we do not re-accredit them either. Um, in terms of the question around career guidance uh, campaigns, um, due to COVID-19, the HWC term wanted to still reach learners, um, young people, or, or anyone that was interested in careers in the health and social sectors. And uh, we developed a career guidance portal 
So this is a automated portal. Um, it is available uh, to anyone online. And in fact, it is almost a, a one-stop shopping. You can go into the, the portal. It is easy to navigate through. The portal contains all the careers associated and occupations associated with health and social development, as well as veterinary science. And in fact, it allows a person to undertake a questionnaire. And based on the answers of that questionnaire, the portal indicates to the user um, what type of careers they are best suited to. And once you then start looking into the, the various occupations that are available, um, it also tells you where those qualifications can be obtained, um, funding routes, um, and information about that particular career. Uh, we have actually had tremendous success in launching our careers portal. And last financial year, in fact, we reached 8,402 learners through that portal. And we had far exceeded, in fact, uh, the planned targets. However, um, coupled with that, we still go out to career guidance events. Uh, we actually last year um, participated in 14 events. And um, we, are, we have just launched a campaign on uh, veterinary science career guidance. And we are actually busy uh, with that. Um, we, we have had various interventions on social media, including um, off the cuff with the deputy minister. And uh, we are now going to go into the provinces, into rural schools uh, to convey or, or to communicate information around veterinary science careers. Uh, so we, we also take that quite seriously um, in terms of reaching young people. Bursaries. Um, in terms of our presentation, we, we do put a substantial amount aside uh, for bursaries every year. In-house bursaries, um, I must assume these are bursaries for staff of the HWCTA. And yes, we actually also invest in our own staff. So we offer staff every year opportunities to study further as long as it is relevant to their jobs or um, where they actually see themselves within the HWC term. And of course, we, we also do um, support any skills programs that will also assist them in uh, performing their, their jobs and increasing productivity. Um, in terms of advertising, uh, where bursaries um, can be, or, or the process of acquiring bursaries or learnerships, or applying for bursaries and learnerships, internships, or any of our other programs, we do go through our employers. However, uh, as I've mentioned, we do give guidance um, to anyone through our career guidance portal, but we do believe, Chair, that we can improve on this particular communication um, and our interaction with the minister a few months ago, it was quite evident that if a learner wants to know where, how they can obtain an HWC to learnership, where do they really go? So we do need to improve on this and uh, we certainly will put interventions in place uh, to ensure that we can get the message out to anyone that is interested in our programs. With regards to our interventions with schools, um, we've had a number of interventions. So during COVID-19, uh, the HWC invested over 100 million rand in COVID-19 interventions because COVID-19 specifically, um, uh, of our, our sector was specifically affected by COVID-19. And we wanted to ensure that as an HWC, so we were there to support our sector's needs 
uh, quickly and be very responsive. So in terms of one of the programs was uh, the funding of graduate interns. These were social workers um, that we employed on an internship uh, for 12 months. And they went out into communities under the uh, Department of Social Development and with our various other parties or partners, including the Vitz Health Consortium. And they um, did psychosocial support. Um, it was very needed during the, the time, and this has also been a very successful uh, program. In terms of, um, we have two other projects. Uh, one is a project with the University of KwaZulu-Natal and Ma Arts Institute, where we also employed unemployed, uh, sorry, where we put on an internship, 20 unemployed graduates. So these were social workers or psychologists, um, those type of professionals, and they also were on a 12 month uh, internship. And they specifically went into hotspot areas in the KZN province, also doing psychosocial, um, tele psychosocial counseling, counseling, they went into schools, they were on community radio, and it was um, awareness about COVID-19, but it went into a lot more detail than that. It was also awareness on gender-based violence, on mental health issues, and a, a, a host of other range of uh, challenges experienced by communities, by youth, uh, by learners in schools. So um, these uh, 20 young interns were supervised by 10 professionals in, in the sector. And um, they even conducted plays at schools to convey the message. And then finally, a current project that uh, we have is also in the KZN area. And this is also an internship program whereby we've taken 100 child and youth care workers and we have um, paired them up and they are in 50 schools in the KZN area. So it's two child and youth care workers per school. It is also over 12 months. It is an internship and all our internships have um, stipends attached to them and uh, they are specifically going into the schools to address bullying. So um, that program is going well. Um, it is due to end um, in the second quarter of this year. And we are hoping that um, it, it'll have great impact and then we can actually um, expand that program further to other provinces. I'm um, just looking at some of the other questions. Uh, yes, the training of nurses was disrupted uh, by uh, the nursing qualifications moving to high education. Um, it, it did take some while uh, for the uh, council to accredit training providers. The HWC does not credit any nursing colleges or any institutions offering nursing qualifications. This is at higher education level, um, but we are hoping that um, the initiatives that we are putting in place with regards to the future nursing can actually try and assist with the situation where we have shortage of nurses. Um, we, we have actually started a, a research program, a study, um, on immigration of nurses to other countries. So in, in fact, this was identified by our board that we hadn't consider, considered this in our research. And so we have it as part of our research agenda for this year. And we are well in uh, the way, uh, we are well into this particular study and a re report is due around July this year. And uh, Chair, we can definitely share that uh, with the Portfolio Committee. 
I'm sure it'll give us quite a bit of information as well. Uh, Chair, with regards to transformation, uh, we are serious about transformation. We support transformation. And in every program that the HWC to funds, we ensure that at least 70% of the learners on the program do come from disadvantaged either areas, districts, or um, they are black learners. So we, we ensure that um, in terms of our sector, uh, that we are fully transformed. Uh, we did identify an issue with regards to transformation in the veterinary science sector um, with veterinary science uh, surgeons and our chairperson of our board is a veterinary doctor. Um, that, um, that particular degree uh, is only offered by the University of Pretoria and we have had struggles to ensure transformation. And hence uh, the HWC to focus on career guidance in the veterinary science sector uh, to actually reach out to ensure that information around veterinary science is known by everyone. And we have made commitments that any black learner that wants to go into a veterinary science career, the HWC will fund that. Okay, I'm just looking at other questions. Um, in terms of COVID-19, uh, we were impacted, especially with regards to nursing. Um, what was the response? Um, there was additional capacity that was needed in the sector. Um, especially in the hospitals, the HWC responded to additional training. Um, there was such a need for, for upskilling nurses from general nursing to high care and ICU nursing. And uh, with the Department of Health, uh, we engaged in that skills training and that, that proved to be extremely successful as well. Um, and as I mentioned, Chair, the HWC to put aside 100 million rand uh, just to support COVID-19 interventions. I'm just looking at other questions. I think I may have, in fact, answered most of the of the questions. Um, so in, in terms of our monitoring and evaluation, we do monitoring and evaluation in a number of areas. So we so we do it with regards to learners that have come through um, our qualifications. Uh, we, we monitor the quality of training there. And then all of our programs through discretionary grants, we monitor every single program. So um, we, we have MOUs with the employers and uh, throughout uh, the tranche payments, uh, certain conditions have to be met. And uh, part of those conditions is uh, the HWC to officials going out, um, looking at bank statements, looking at supporting documentation to ensure that our funding is not misused, to ensure that there is no fraud. Um, however, it is not 100%. Um, if, if you actually look at the statistics, if any company thinks they do not have fraud, then they are definitely misled. Um, but the HWC to endeavors to strengthen our internal controls continuously uh, to ensure that we can be one above uh, fraudsters um, and ensure that if there is any misappropriation, corruption or fraud, that we are able to also detect it uh, very quickly. I'm just having a look, Chair, if there's anything further. Uh, with regards to challenges of certification, a question that came through there. Um, at the moment, we don't have any challenges. Um, I was in a conference uh, about two weeks back on child and youth care. And 
a question was raised about um, some certificates not being signed. And I also gave the commitment that um, if there are any queries, those queries would be sent to me directly and we would ensure um, that uh, we, uh, if, if the learners have been verified, uh, then they are also certified. Uh, but Chair, we can indicate that we do not, as an HWC, to have any backlog in uh, certifications. Uh, Chair, I do believe those are the questions, and I do apologize if I may have missed one. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Chair, okay, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Honorable uh, Chair. Thank you. Hello. Yes, it's over to you, Honorable uh, They concluded uh, with the responses. Thank you. Yes, uh, I was asking if they can hear me because uh, this network has started. Yeah, we can hear you, Honorable Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, no, thank you very much, um, colleagues, um, everybody with your responses. It is now 13.22. Um, those who, uh, please, who did not um, provide us with uh, comprehensive uh, answers, please do so in writing or giving you seven days from today. So next week, uh, tomorrow by end of business, please provide us with, um, with those uh, answers. So uh, having said, said that, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. We're going to allow you to to leave us. We have um, uh, all members of uh, the portfolio committee will remain with uh, our uh, uh, colleagues who are uh, our staff, so that we can deal with the minutes and the report. I think or just the minutes. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Mzuyanda, uh, uh, who else? Sonti, Sipokazi, and DGC. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, DG. I know, man. Uh, I, I think I didn't talk to uh, Parliament. I think I must just stop going to Parliament. My name is Avan Vukula, man. 
Not you. <laughs> uh, not you, mama. I asked you to a back in the country. Who stuff still sending you, mama? Have a nice day, Chair. I, I, I think you are not. You have not taken your medicine. <laughs> Uh, Anale, uh, which which set of minutes are we starting with? Um, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Tsie, and um, to the Honorable Members. Uh, we have uh, three set of minutes to adopt uh, in this meeting. Um, the minutes uh, are as per the agenda. Um, uh, that we that we sent so it is the minutes of the 18th of may um the minutes of the 20th as well as the minutes of the 25th of may those are the three sets of minutes thank you so much sure uh colleagues uh those are the sets of minutes uh out of all the the the, the minutes of all the dates that uh, Anna just spoke about. Do we have any corrections to make, colleagues, in any of them? Or if you don't have any corrections, can we move to adopt them, Co colleagues? Can I see a hand of Mama Nani Sosubuletsui? Let's hear, Mama. Eh, thank you, Chairperson. Eh. Let me start by actually indicating uh, th this particular menace that one wants to adopt as a true reflection of the meeting. Uh, the first one of the 18th of May, it was, uh, it is a report with regards to MUT independent assessor. Uh, and then uh, the other one is with regards to the 20th one of May, preliminary a report of Sifako uh, Makhato thing of um, Professor Mpati and the others. And the one of the 25th May is Southwest Routing and Northern Cape Urban CGE report. Uh, I just wanted to indicate that so that as I adopt, uh, it's an indication that I've went through the minutes and uh, the first minute is eight pages. The second one is three pages eight pages as well and the other one is eight pages so it's a true reflection of the meeting and i hear move to adopt them uh, with no amendment so far thank you thank you very much uh, honorable manani so anyone uh, to second thanks i would like to sub to second the adoption of the minutes by honorable manani so thanks thank you any descending view in the absence of the descending views, uh, colleagues, all the minutes uh, would have been um, uh, seconded. Uh, uh, colleagues, uh, thank you very much for attending today's meeting. We wish to remind you that uh, we'll meet again on Friday. And uh, please take care of yourselves, Don. Uh, get sick like some of us uh, colleagues will see you on uh, on our maniso. yeah uh, thank you chair as you attend the meeting i just wanted uh, you to indicate that we'll consider all five reports on friday uh, that we were supposed to actually consider into this meeting thank you all right thank you very much uh, 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 with that insightful uh, information. Co colleagues, uh, all uh, uh, reports uh, will be considered on Friday. Thank you very much and uh, have a lovely day to all of you. This meeting is urgent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Lale. I get on soon, eh, uh, honorable sir.
Recording stopped.